Hello and welcome to The Culture Bar, a panel discussion podcast exploring, dissecting and shedding light on important topics in the arts and music world which matter to you. So hello and welcome everybody. On this podcast we're going to be discussing how the music industry could get more involved in music education to broaden music career horizons. Um, and our luminary panel um, in alphabetical order is comprised of Hannah Eakins, who is the CEO of Production Future, Ruth Minton, who is a lecturer in classical music performance at the University of Liverpool and a trustee of the Harrison Parrott Foundation, Dr Oliver Morris, who's the Director of Education and Skills at UK Music and runs the MAP, which stands for the Music Academic Partnership, and finally, last but not least, Jay Picasso, who's Artist Relationship Manager at Abbey Road and also an MC and Rap Lecturer at ACM. So to get us started, I suppose, um, what does the current higher music education landscape look like? And does anybody from this group have any thoughts on the current provision? I'm happy to jump in there um, because we run, as I said, the Music Academic Partnership. Um, it was set up to sort of link industry and academia um, and I'm fortunate enough to work with lots of different partners uh, from awarding bodies to FE colleges and HE institutions too and you know I have to say I mean that there is a great range of types of institutions there's really some really interesting uh, work going on there's lots of different courses I think it shows the sort of like understanding of the possibilities around careers in music that it has grown so strongly and powerfully over the last few years. Um, yeah, so I mean, there, there's some, I think there's some great provision. Um, there's uh, always more to be done, and I'm sure we'll get onto that later on in terms of industry and academia working together. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think it's it's really positive and, and, and working right at the sort of cold face of it. I, I sort of, you know, I, I'm, I'm really chuffed at the amount of provision and, and, and the breadth of stuff that is, is out there. There are obviously things that could improve, um, and, and there's lots of things the industry could do, could do better as well. But, You know, that's my take, which we'll get into detail, I'm sure, a bit more later on. And do you think, I'm just adding a new question because you sparked a thought, do you think that has changed significantly over, let's say, the past decade? Because my experience in music education is largely my own, uh, not working at the whole face of it. And I'm not sure there was quite the same breadth of courses available as there is now, and certainly not ones that actually feed into kind of career pathways possibly as well as they do now. No, I, I think you're right. And um, I mean, I, I suppose the instrumental route always existed and conservatoires, that kind of thing, have, have, have existed for a long, long time. Um, but the idea of being able to study and professionalise, if you like, the industry side, you know, has been a relatively new in a, you know development. And you I'm sure all of us have met people in the industry now today who say, oh, yeah, I just started out by doing X, Y or Z, helping someone out, you know, informal links and informal routes in, which still have a place. But, you know, been able to study and become an expert in your field, whether it be music management or, you know, um, publishing or all, all these different elements that we rely on as an industry is really, I think, really beneficial. And it, and it raises the bar for everyone. I think as people come through who do know their onions, <laughs> use the old phrase uh, and really know their stuff you know I think it's exciting and I've met so I'm privileged to have worked with so many universities and I met so many bright students that really are you know that it's not a hobby that they, they see it as absolutely as a career and they want to get as, as skilled as possible so you know it's, it's really enthusing to see that and, and, and to feel that almost like innovation coming through and, and the fresh perspectives that we all rely on as an industry definitely so yeah, I, th- I think it's great. I mean, it doesn't undermine the need for um, other routes in, which is a really important part of, of the landscape and the need for apprenticeships, the need for paid internships, all that kind of stuff. But I think being able to say, yes, we have a really decent sort of mix of institutions teaching this and developing research around it as well. I mean, that's the other associated area, which is really exciting, the sort of academic research piece as well. So yeah, many, many bits, you know, and I think it's very positive. Yeah, I mean, I just add to what Oliver said. I think one of the things, like you said, Lissy, we all have our own experience of music education. And then obviously for those of us who have then gone to work in the industry, you see it in so many different guises. And I think one of the things that, you know, Oliver just said is 
there's now so many courses in me in higher education that reflect the so many branches of the music industry you know I remember when I was initially finishing my degree people just didn't understand what I would do with a music degree those who didn't work in the music industry they were just like well what are you going to do and do you get paid for that and you're like yes yes I do and now it's 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 now been just expanded so much that students are coming to university with much more knowledge of how many career paths they can have and also how the music industry is an industry where you can combine so many of those paths it's not necessarily having to do one sole path of okay I'm just I'm a pianist that's that's my one job you know I've had lots of jobs and still retain lots of roles and hats as many of us do and I think that's one of the things that now the provision is showing, which is a really positive step forward. Yeah, definitely. And that that really resonates with me. I remember when I was looking at, um, perhaps I'll show my age here, but when I was looking at attending conservatoire, I was like, oh, it's really just, just performance through and through and through. Whereas I think nowadays there are courses relating to music management and some of the other tools and skills that you're actually going to need either as a professional musician or as someone that's going to take those musical skills and uh, work in other roles. So how do we think music industry and music education um, could partner to improve quality perhaps of education or just how those partnerships could work? I want to kind of talk about music education and industry partnering and what could arise from that that's positive. Well, certainly from the live production side of it, um, there is a lot that industry can do. There is a lot that industry are doing. Uh, But certainly from our production future side, we are linking industry to education. And it's really important that we show these hidden job roles because a lot of these job roles are hidden and they have been even more hidden because of the pandemic. And we feel that if we can show those different job roles and the pathways into them that well we've seen that that is really working with young people to see the different opportunities whether it's through an apprenticeship or through higher education um or you know a combination a degree apprenticeship whatever it might be um there is not a one size fits all and it really feels like linking industry is perhaps something that everybody um, should be participating in to get the most out of the education that these students are are in these amazing you know the amazing courses that certainly in production there's some fantastic ones and there certainly weren't a lot of those around um, for many years and a lot of people that I know um, who have been in the industry for many years didn't go down the, those didn't weren't have those courses available But now that they are available, it's linking that all sorts of other things, you know, the real world working environment, what that looks like, uh, the hours, the expectations, um, and actually getting into that real world working environment before they've completed their their courses as well is really important for the employers at the other end. I think that's a really valid point as well, that actually by getting involved, industry somehow kind of helping to help shape and mold the graduates that they are actually then hopefully going to employ so I suppose a good follow-up question or not might be sort of what do you think the main benefit is that industry kind of brings to higher education settings is it resources is it expertise is it skills is it mentoring like it, it would be really kind of useful to learn from your perspective um where you think the real value add is well they they work in it every day so they know how fast it's changing technology's changing um you know the, everything's changing the skill sets are changing and because there is such a huge skill shortage they have to be aware of telling education what they need and what they you know they hope for when a graduate or a Um, someone coming out of college is coming out with the right skill set that they require because it's changing all the time and it's certainly changed a lot since the pandemic so so there's kind of two sides to this the education side um, you know are those tutors still in touch with that working real world working environment that we're in now Um, and 
do they realize how many opportunities there are and how many different opportunities there are than from even two years ago or last year? Um, and it's keeping up to date with those technologies and and the changes um, and hybrid events now and how everything is just being delivered in a different way. Um, but yes, mentoring, mentorships, amazing. I think that that's really important. You know, it's showing the the real world environment um, and that practical, offering that practical uh, working experience, whether it's in a summer holidays or in a you know in a placement setting, um, but also um, the way the industry is represented is really important because certainly for me, I've been in the industry for twenty years. And, you know, it still is has such a long way to go in how it's seen and how it's represented and how it should be inclusive. So certainly with Production Futures, what we do is show it, it, it how the world is represented. So if you can see it, you can be it. So, you know, it's not a coincidence that if we have female sound engineers or female lighting designers coming to engage with young people that that feels comfortable for them and they're able to try things too or get or speak to those people about how they feel the industry is represented as well and opens up um, a very honest conversation about how it how it has looked before and how it needs to look. It, it is absolutely true that when you see it you you do you believe it um did anyone else want to reflect on that? Yeah I, I could I could pick up um, please do jay thank you uh, yeah um i mean just some brilliant brilliant points there i think um you know part of i think part of the collaboration between industry and education is based on um you know what you see um particularly as a student um in terms of you know who's representing you in in different industry you know jobs uh, and i think that association from the off is is key because you know we do see a huge lack um, in diversity, which of course is changing and, and 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 is you know we're moving in the right direction with a lot of initiatives, um, which is brilliant. But you know at the same time we we don't see um, you know as often as we could um, certain students even gravitate towards certain career paths because they don't necessarily see themselves represented in those areas. Um, so it's the, I think it's a huge thing. Um, I think one of the solutions here is, um, you know, along along with sort of uh, having tutors who are actually working in the industry um, and actually, you know, participating in something professional in the industry. And, and there are many facets. And of course, that can be, you know, far and wide, but should should certainly be the case. Um, I think the on the other end, the industry's involvement is to offer internships. And I, I, I say internships because oftentimes they are so broad in bringing someone in that they allow that person to often see more area than one in the industry that they may or may not have considered. Um, and I think it's good for two reasons, because obviously this is a very competitive industry um, and in education, you know, the idea is that you you learn to, you know, craft your your hot, you know, you you sort of uh, craft your skills and, and and stuff. However, there is this sort of uh, glamorization of our industry as well, and so, you know, through internships, oftentimes we can sort of get rid of those who don't really want it, um, you know, and who thought it was just going to be, you know, uh, flights and uh, you know, backstage tickets and stuff. Um, which which of course it is but it's like actually how prepared are you to work for it because you know we also live in a world where um, you know the other sort of side to education or the other alternative route now of course is just going to get experience I, I, and you know particularly in the music industry now we're talking about things like TikTok so you don't even have to have you know gone to get experience you can just manufacture your own career on your iPhone or you know on your you know on your handset and 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 so that you know again technology has evolved how 
the industry and how education also need to work together because these things are going so quickly um, that they have to be on top of it. So just to summarize, because I know I've said a lot and forgive me, um, but to summarize, I think there's two main things here, which is that the industry must offer students and pro pro potentially partner with universities like directly to offer internships to, to graduates. Um, and the second thing is that it, the university side, the education side, the higher education side rather, must be must have tutors with professional backgrounds in the industry and those who are still actively participating in the industry today because as i mentioned before it is ever changing and if they do not participate in today's industry before you know it it's second hand knowledge and no longer relevant and that is the most off putting thing to students um, you know, in terms of deciding whether to often spend this money to be educated or to go out and try and find a career, you know, uh, and be a few years ahead. So, yeah. <laughs> that was that was amazing. I think I agreed with everything you said, uh, not least of which that how how much the industry is glamorized. I'm like, yes, there's travel, but it's a 5 a.m. flight uh, and there are concerts to go to, which wait but there's also invoices to raise and withholding tax to think about uh, and I think as many opportunities to sort of try before you buy um, are very very important but yeah very much uh, with you as well of having tutors with professional experience there's a real I just feel like you connect so much more with the tutor who has actually been out there and lived it they're not just sort of talking in that theoretical paradigm it's very much well this was my experience see if that's interesting to you um, so I suppose, unless there are any more reflections on that question, a kind of interesting follow-up might be, how do young people actually find out about music careers? If they're not at, you know, one of Ollie's amazing organisations or somewhere where there's already something, uh, a partnership in place, how are young people finding out about music careers? Um, sort of how do they get exposed to different career options, you know, beyond the obvious performing or teaching, which is what it was when I was younger, certainly. Yeah, um, if I can jump in quickly on that, because we do quite a lot of careers work, I mean, we work with production features loads, so, you know, brilliant work with Hannah. Um, I mean, there are, it's sort of, it's an interesting question, and it's one that comes up a lot um, in the work I do, and I think sometimes people assume there's a silver bullet, there's like one, there is a solution out there, if only we can find it. And actually, what it really boils down to is, is throwing as much information out there through as many different partnerships as possible, and hoping you you reach those those people that are considering it. So a couple of examples are, you know, we, we've built up our our careers outreach work. So we, we've been doing um, work at the skills show, you know, obviously sadly the COVID has not been on, but it's the largest skills careers fair in, 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 in the UK. So we do that every, every year um, in, in, when it's in person, obviously. You know, we work at BBC Introducing on their, um, on their live events so we were running the careers fair during the the, the, the in-person event in tobacco dock and and now they're, they're, they're doing smaller satellite events this year so we're going to be working with them we work with organizations that have networks so people like global bridge they're, they're a great little organization set up by teachers that are really trying to link up young people with with um uh professionals and, and universities and industry speakers you know so that so there's multiple routes, and we do work a lot with with um, other creative industries partners too. So, so we we we've put in a second bid for a follow up um, to our Discover Creative Careers program. So that enabled us to develop new apprenticeships. That enabled us to to share more information. There's a great website out there if you Google Discover Creative Careers to help you sort of find where you might sit fit in in the creative uh, landscape. You know, so as I say, that there's there's lots of options out there. But it's, yes, there's never a single thing, a single bullet. It's just a case of trying to trying to share as much as possible and uh, and hope it's picked up. Because you know, I mean, I don't know about everyone else here. I grew up in a small town in West Wales. You know, um, we, we used to do gigs in the school hall, and I had no concept of there being a career beyond like playing my guitar a bit. You know, literally no no concept of it whatsoever. So, um, you know, I think as we can get as much information out there as possible and and try and share it, you know. In, in as much dispersed a way as possible as well that that will really help and yeah check out all of our you know, like UK music members too I mean if you're out there you know we exist we've got lots of job profiles on our site but we also have members and a really important part of any person's development in their career is is sort of tapping into those um, networks that can help them professionally 
you know so all of our members exist to support them you know so I, I really do encourage them to sort of try and join you know if you're a student you know and, and you're a musician join the MU it's 20 quid a year and you get insurance you get networking opportunities you can get involved in the community so there, there's lots of lots of ways you can get involved and find that information but first step I reckon is go to ukmusic.org and uh, you know ha, ha, have, have a look around there Although I do now want to drag our conversation down into the murky depths of considering what some of the possible deficiencies are in the current provision. So whether that's on the education side, whether it's the industry, I've kind of, whether there are doors closed, putting some ideas out there. What are there? If there are any, maybe it's all go great, uh, but I somehow think not. But we've had some wonderful ideas on what could be enhanced and what could bolster and what could improve. Um, that I think it's quite important to reflect as well on on where we're perhaps not doing so well. Well, I think as I was listening to, to Oliver there, I think one of the things that really strikes me is the fact that we're all doing what we can, um, but we're always still coming up against so many barriers as well. And some of these barriers are often put when it's lower down. So when they get to us at the higher education level, they've already opted to take a course in music or the creative industries and have opted to say that's something I want to do but obviously a part of what we do as you know was fantastic I didn't know some of those things so I will go and look those up later on and um, that obviously do go down into the school level but obviously with the school level as well we're continually up against the funding issues of the arts subjects in schools and the perception that some teachers and those people within the schools have on the creative subjects. And I can tell numerous tales, as I'm sure we all can, of when I used to work at um, the Junior Conservatory in Birmingham, I'd have students come to me on a Saturday, and obviously they were privileged to come to the Junior Conservatory on Saturday. And they'd tell me stories of their school where a headmistress had stood up and said, don't bother taking art, music or drama, because you'll never get a career in that, it's a waste of your time. And I'd have a 15 year old girl in tears with me on the Saturday saying, but I wanna do this, H how do I do it? And I think that is something we can't obviously solve overnight. That is changing perceptions over a longer time. And I think the more we can have these partnerships that work in HE, but then obviously within the schools, obviously with the HP Foundation and lots of talks with um, hubs and different things to get to younger people, so children, teenagers, and then keeping them interested as they get older. Um, but I think that is one of the areas of our barriers that we have to come up against to make sure that at that school level, there is a true understanding of what a, a career in the creative industry is and actually how fantastic it can be. Yes, it's hard work, but actually we're all sitting here and I'm pretty sure most of us would not change our career for, for anything. I know, well, I know I wouldn't, but, um, and I think that's something they need to see. And I think the more we have the opportunity to go in to work with those younger people, as well as at the higher education level, that then shows them that real life experience. And they're not just hearing it from a teacher and many teachers are fantastic. Um, and hats off to them, but they're not just hearing it from the teacher who's continually up against budget cuts and teachers and governors saying, well, actually don't do this, but they are seeing it from real life people in the profession as well. And I think that's one of our biggest barriers that we've continuously got to chip away at. Thank you, Ruth. That was really, really inspiring. Hannah, please. Yeah, we've actually seen this at Production Futures, actually, this, that as soon as we offer to pay for coaches to come from schools and colleges, so just to give you a recap uh, or an overview of what Production Futures is, we create a show um, and we go into um, a, either a live venue or, or an educational institute and we take over basically for the day as industry do, um, and we create learning zones, we have panel sessions, we have jobs, we have placements, a whole plethora of uh, opportunities for whether you're a, a school leaver through to a graduate and you, you do, do you go freelance, do you not? You know, lots of advice of, of we 
joined forces with amazing associations like UK Music, Live Group, uh, Black Lives in Music, Association for Electronic Music, anyone that we can collaborate with, we will, because we want to make sure that we are linking this industry to um, younger people as early as possible. And when, obviously, we couldn't, we used to do it before the pandemic. And then, of course, um, some of our events that we delivered coming out of the pandemic, um, we couldn't get coaches because of COVID, but now we can. And now we can really start to invite that that crucial age where, you know, their parents or their teachers might need that reassurance that this is a viable career. Certainly from the production side, you know, we're so hidden that it's really difficult to sometimes sell it to someone. Um, but actually, I think parents are getting more and more on board with these creative careers and how they want to support their children into careers that they enjoy and that, um, you know, that they their dream job can be possible because actually the world is waiting for them and there's never been more opportunity actually in live production um so you know it's reassuring and it's it's hard when it's that one person or that one teacher that that makes that decision that maybe doesn't believe in it and I think that's probably where we need to do better at saying no please can we engage as industry because we you know we know that um the earlier we can connect with young people, the better, be, and to be in their sightline as a viable career. So, so yeah, I just think it's that that's been very apparent. Certainly, last week when we did our event in Wakefield, so we tour the event around the UK, and we go into that community and invite all the local schools and colleges. And we don't, if we are in a university, we don't just rely on that university to do that. We do that too, because we want to make sure that everybody in that city or town that we're visiting is welcome and that there is an opportunity for them in and a pathway for them. And even just a networking opportunity or if they have questions, um, the, I think that definitely is. And also it's the government, you know, in, in the pandemic, a lot of young people that, I mean, these amazing graduates and school leavers that wanted to come into these industries where are they from 2020 2021 you know we need to find them we need to connect with them and you know tell them that there is a skill shortage and that there are so many opportunities for them and actually now is a um probably one of the best times to be young and, and have all of these opportunities because I don't think there's ever been a recruitment drive like it in the industry and, and a need for that for that skill short for that skill set um and it's in every job technical non-technical roles whether you're um yeah anything that provides an opportunity um with your skill set it can be fit into the live production industry really it's really interesting i think reflecting on the barriers a piece of research that i did last year with um goldsmith university um was not just finding the barriers but actually looking at engagement drivers uh, because one thing that I've always found quite curious is it's quite acceptable to say oh, I just don't like sport I'm not very sporty I'm very sporty so I find this a very offensive statement um, but with music you know just really being a bit inflammatory I suppose uh, we can't kind of quite come to terms sometimes with the concept of someone's just being like oh, I just don't don't like music I just don't want to engage with it so um again not not my view but I do find it interesting how there there's sometimes an awful lot of opportunities but people don't always know what they're kind of looking for and they don't know what they want to engage with and there are so many other factors that determine whether you actually take up an opportunity or not um the most obvious one is obviously kind of socioeconomic status and whether your parents are interested in the arts because so often with young people if the parents are not interested in music don't place a particularly high value on it um you know that opportunity is probably not going to come to fruition um that's just interesting what you said then i think the interesting difference between sport and music is i think music you'd be really hard pressed to find anyone that didn't have it as a part of their lives and quite a, quite an integral part of their lives i think the issues come when what well, well, the forms of engagement so so I dropped out of school as soon as I could and I, I went on and later on I was like oh 
you know, I missed out there. I should do some education. And so I got back into studying lots. <laughs> uh, but I, I dropped out as soon as I could because I hated the sort of structures of school. I absolutely hated it. So I think it's it's like I, I played in a band from the age of 14. And we, we, we play in school, but only ever the, like, I don't know, what was a school disco or, you know, the, the odd comic relief assembly sort of thing. So we, I was engaged in music. But I just hated the structures around lessons in school. So I think it's important to sort of, and I think music we've almost pushed against an open door with um, the most people because music's integral to all of our identities. That that's why I love it so much. I think it's just such a part of all our identities. And and the follow-on point, which I thought of when you were talking before, is just and Hannah actually Hannah's point she made the sort of flagging that the opportunities that exist in the creative arts, at, but that are not necessarily creative roles is important because you can have a career in the creative arts and, and be a lawyer or a, you know, there's there's multiple things you can do in the creative arts and you might just like the 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 the, the um the process of getting involved in that as a as a as an individual. Um and also the importance of creating I mean we've got to keep keep flagging this and talking passionately about it because the importance of creative skills to the economy as a whole, not just not just the creative arts. Not just the creative industries, you know, it's so important. So we should try and steer away from the sort of idea that there's they're separate. They're not absolutely, you know, and there's there's lovely crossover and synergy. We just got to sort of talk a lot about it as well. Just to add to that, you just made me think as well the fact that one of the things you see, I'm sure Jade is when you, when your students now see employability is a big thing we talk to with our students. You know, when all of our modules, it's well, how is this helping you from an employability perspective? What is it teaching you? And obviously I'm, I'm obviously a musician. So one of the things is how transferable the skills are in music. And I think that's something we can obviously use within that creative industries discussion. Um, like I said, you know, like the accountants, the lawyers, we need all of those, whether people um, within our industry as well. And but the skills that we have as musicians going back to the school side of things. And I think linking so much of that. And I mean, this is a wider topic for education and how our education system works is that students are taught so much in a box you know my favorite example is if I ask a student in a music lesson well, what happened in 1789 and they look at me just rather blankly because that was a history lesson why would they know what happened in 1789 in music and um, and I think realizing how much there's such crossover between the creative industries with everything else is something that we need to maximise more on in all of these partnerships and conversations we have along the way. Um, and if I may add as well um, to that, I think, you know, just back to the, the question as well, that the, the, the barrier here partly is that, and I think it's changing, but I think that the actual, um, the degree, the, um, the qualification uh, in the music industry does not transfer as well as it does in other industries and in fact it's the same in the creative art space in general there is no degree in this industry necessarily that gives you the job and that's one of the problems that we have because you have lots of students who have music degrees even though they have different specialisms within that degree and it's just called a music degree and then they are going for a you know a multitude of jobs and often these particular jobs want you to have experience. And the one thing, you know, at the top of your CV that a degree will tell you is that you don't have experience because that's the thing you've put at the top. And so it's, it's that, it's making it more transferable. It's making it something that's actually, you know, that carries more weight. And I think that's partly done through you know the fusing of actual experience you know there's there's a lot of other um there's a lot of other sectors of the education uh, um of education rather where they are required to do a year's worth of training somewhere you know in order to get a job anywhere else um and and i think partly integrating that is going to be how we kind of cross this barrier of because I even have friends who have music degrees but no longer work in music you know and I think to be honest with you that's the bulk of my class you know that's the bulk of the, of graduates you know uh, that, that would have been in my class they they don't work in the music industry and I think it was because they didn't know where to put that 
outside of you know some of the more obvious pathways and and i think again it's it's how you even transfer it it, it you know for the first 10 years out of university telling people I had a degree meant nothing, <laughs> you know? It was like, and what? Where's your experience? You know, what does that mean? And so again, it's just coming back to making sure that we, you know, as the education sector help students, and this is where it becomes more of a personal thing, you know, a, a, and an interaction between the, the tutor and the student themselves, we educate them in ways of being, you know, professional and entrepreneurs and thinking of, you know, how to, you know, if you can't get a job immediately, you're creative. How are you going to be an entrepreneur? How are you going to start your own business? How are you going to, you know, how do you become, you know, what years ago when I was uh, graduating, you know, as a drummer originally, that was the pathway. Maybe I'll get a gig, but now it's a business. You, you, you have to be an entire business to be a drummer. You can have lessons, online lessons, Zoom classes, you know, content for people to download on YouTube and, and, and sell it on a private page. And there's so many more facets to it now because of the technology so it's also like how do we prepare people to um, engage in this industry even if they're not given a job because partly what has made this industry so great is the amount of people that have done that created their own thing and then brought jobs in and you know my role right now at Abbey Road did not exist five years ago and it's this kind of entrepreneurial spirit that sometimes exists out of getting so you know out of outside of being given a job that creates this creativity and, and and spawns that as well so it's also feeding into the students the fact that as a creative individual you have to think way outside of the box when it comes to even the industry you know you are the industry you just don't know it yet and, and that's you know partly conveying that as we go i think is is going to be uh, a huge solution to you know this this barrier can i jump in there please, please. Um, because yeah i absolutely agree jay it's that transferable skill that being job ready seems to be this disconnect that we're seeing um that in other, a lot of other countries, you are encouraged to do a work placement, usually for a year in that in a business, within a production company or within, you know, a certain, um, and you're actively encouraged to be job ready. Whereas there are, we are hearing from a lot of students that they have learned in the classroom, therefore they are ready for, um, for working. And and that's not necessarily always the case. And it certainly isn't in live production because there's a very different scenario from what you're learning in a very safe virtual or studio or uh, stage within your uh, campus to what's happening out there. And things are going wrong and things are solutions are having to be found very, very instantaneously. And I think that real world and maybe that has been the industry's fault too for being a bit uh, reluctant to maybe take those young people coming out of education because they they maybe have had experiences before where they're not job ready and yet they were told they were or they thought they were and they're really not and that doesn't help with their confidence with that student's that graduate's confidence um, and it can therefore lead to them going to other industries or you know jobs where they're not they're not following their dreams they're not doing what they wanted to do and sometimes maybe they need to be encouraged into roles that may not be right for them right now but they are still in creative industry they're still you know it could be a production company in their local area or it could be a crew company out on site you, you know just even being in that environment around people where they can meet people that it just takes meeting one person to lead them to meet another opportunity. But if they're working in a shop or in a bar, completely away from that creative space and that creative um, type of person that they want to work with in that environment, it can really affect their confidence and make it feel further away. And so it's down to industry and it's down to, I guess, education to make sure that that student is nurtured in a way of being job ready. And the transferable skills, um, you said, Ruth, is so important because if you're just studying lighting design and that's all you know in a theatre environment, then, you know, if you can use your spare time to learn about 
lighting design in a live environment or in a, a different environment or in a TV setting or if you could as many skills as possible and use that that three years to not just learn about that subject you're learning about but also to learn about everything else and then the dots actually join a lot quicker when you're ready to face that working world. And we are now going to pause for a quick message from our friends at Things Musicians Don't Talk About. If you're listening to this, we reckon you're in with a good chance of enjoying our podcast too. Hi, I'm Rebecca, and along with my co-host Hattie, we run the Things Musicians Don't Talk About podcast and online platform. As you can probably guess from the title, we delve into things that have been stigmatised or brushed under the carpet such as mental illness, addiction, disability, financial struggles. I mean, the list is endless. You can find us on pretty much any podcast distributor where you can hear us interview spectacular guests. And sometimes Hattie and I just have a chat by ourselves about things that are frustrating and or interesting us right now. We've both dealt with our own mental illness and general struggles alongside our training and work in the classical music world, and we felt that it was about time we said something about it. Search for Things Musicians Don't Talk About on wherever you get your podcasts, and we are at TMDTA Podcast on all the socials. See you soon. This has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you all so much. And I would like to ask two things. One... Jay, are you happy if we now rename the podcast You Are the Industry, You Just Don't Know It Yet? Because I think that's our best box pop so far. That's that's the the, the threshold to beat. So <laughs> come on, yeah, Bruce, Tanner good. and Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's really great that we've all kind of shared similar reflections on what some of the problems still are. Because my my fourth question is going to be, you know, money is out the window it's no longer a problem we're in a we're in a sandbox society what would be some of your top solutions to fix some of these issues if some of the kind of fundamental barriers that we know that we have to work with on a day-to-day basis weren't present uh well how, how deep do you want to go i mean it's structural you know there are so many issues um free and unfettered access to music for all young people you know, free university education, I'd go as far as to say, you know, develop more apprenticeships, but have grants there to help employers take them on, you know, because the creative industries is strong, but there's lots of SMEs, sole traders, lots of innovation, like Jay said, you know, it's, it relies on, it relies on a lot of, lot of energy from people in it to, to keep it going, you know, and, um, and I think, you know, we're a successful industry, but it's sometimes missed, I think, Um, you know, you saw it perhaps a little bit in the, understandings around the issues we faced during COVID, you know, I mean, we, we went from one of the strongest growing parts of the economy to stagnation, really, or dr- big drop off, as you've seen from our economic reports. Um, this is music, you know, but we want to get back and we will get back. It's just a case of that support to get back back up to speed. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I get a lot of people come to talk to me about um, wanting to take on apprentices, you know, and we are developing new apprenticeships, but um without a little bit it doesn't take much a little bit of grant support to to help cover the salaries to start with that makes such a difference to sme um so yeah i mean that for me it's 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 structural it's about access and it's about opportunity widening that opportunity up really out really and that takes a bit of investment but it but it you know it pays itself back in terms of the economy and growth and and happy individuals and working communities and all those sort of things you want in a society so I think music is such a core part to everyone's well-being and our identity and happiness. It's sort of, it's a no-brainer to me. But you know, it's uh, so that's, that's a big ask. Just basically throw lots of support at us. But you know, but yeah, young people deserve deserve the opportunity to study, appreciate, perform music. Um, and it's tricky. A lot of young people face a lot of barriers. I mean, if you're going to school hungry, you're not going to be that worried about recorder lessons, are you? You know what I mean? It's a uh, it's uh, it's very deep and structural to me, the issues. Can I just add, because Ollie and I talk about this a lot, internet, making that free for every young person. I mean, that is just a simple basic that every young person should have access to it. And it's it's that would be amazing. Um, passport, that's expensive. You know, if you have a passport or can drive, driving lessons, you know, 
if you are the person that volunteers to take something somewhere on a plane or in a car, you will probably get that job faster than somebody who can't. So yeah, free passports for all would be amazing. Um, and driving lessons. No free music lessons, just free driving lessons. But I still agree and think it's excellent. Yeah, but just, <laughs> I suppose to make it just level for everybody, you know, so that every opportunity, so that everyone can listen to music, everyone can take any opportunity that's thrown their way. On the car the, radio. The added, the added benefit of protecting everyone's votes as well, if, if you provide everyone with a driving licence or a passport. I think my solution would probably be a bit narrower than that, um, which is 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 really like a, an industry based <laughs> university. And I say university because I think, again, it's the you know, it's kind of the last point people leave education. But that type of level based internship program where mm -hmm. It was like you had to apply via the university who would then, you know, then you would be admitted. Now, I know it doesn't it doesn't solve enough, um, but that's just one solution I think would be really good for anybody trying to take um, more of an executive route, um, certainly uh, an executive route and um, anybody that was more interested, certainly in the business side of things, as opposed to being a performer. What would your your unfettered solution be? Well, I think most of it's been said and the, the main two things for me would be funding and accessibility, because I think one of the, the first things like when people start off, whether it's when they're leaving university or they're considering going to university, those first steps as young adults, the one aspect, especially now with the cost of living crisis and all of those things, is they worry about how they're going to pay for their the roof over their head, the, the bills, the food. And... I have been, you know, self-employed musician where I've literally wondered, okay, can I afford my rent this month? And I know I won't be the only one. And I'm now not in that position, but it took me a long time to get to have a stability in what I do. And I think the more opportunities we can create that are funded so that students are getting that experience, but aren't equally having to think, right, I've actually also got to go work down the supermarket than do nights or do these other jobs but they can literally just completely embed themselves in the creative industry and um, and that is a funding thing because obviously so many opportunities we can't we 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 have lots of opportunities to provide but not all of them are always funded and obviously depending on where they are in the country cost of living is then a factor and i think the more we can offer those opportunities in stable environments for young people the better and that comes from funding and and like ollie and, and everybody said the accessibility so yeah i mean going to rehearsals whether you're a production person whether you're an agent being able to drive transport so the more we can give these opportunities to everybody the the better so i think that that would be my yeah if there were no no issues the two things without a doubt Thank you so much. Um, I only have one last question. Uh, and actually, I think Jay touched on it a little bit earlier when he mentioned TikTok, but is current music education actually reflective of the modern world? I think from everything we've discussed, it sounds like actually it is keeping pace, which is brilliant. And if that's the case, then let's kind of promote that. Um, but is it reflective of the modern world? Is it reflective of the careers that are available and actually what young people want and, and what they identify with when they think about music? Um, I'll jump in quickly first. I mean, I think there's always a lag. That's the trouble. I mean, you get policies come in or, or, or um, thinking come in, which sort of impacts how schools and this might sort of take, take, take it forward. Um, like we, we, we pushed for a long time for the National Plan for Music Education to have technology centre feature more centrally because obviously technology is super absolutely megally different if that's a word um from what it was uh, when the first national plan came out for music in education in england this is so uh, i think there's always naturally a lag um and that's why those individual teachers and those individual community workers um are so important because they're the ones really helping um 
those young people access music and, and, and reflect and, and giving them the spaces to perform what they want to do as well. You know, it's not just about being told for young people. It shouldn't be, you know, I've done plenty of, of work with young people where they're telling me what's going on, you know, and that's good. Uh, that's as it should be, you know. Um, so, yeah, but I, I think, so really part of what I'm trying to say is I think we need to trust those teachers and community workers more. There's, there's often, you know, there's policy directions and there's caveats around funding and there's, you know, there's targets you have to hit around with grants, all that sort of stuff. And I think to a certain extent, almost we should trust those that are doing it a lot more. I, th I think there's a danger we, we, we try and tie everything up. And like I said before, it's my favourite saying, but we always assume there's a silver bullet for everything. And I've done enough community work in enough different communities to know that something that works in one isn't necessarily going to work in another, you know, and it's, that's down to geography, um, community leaders. There's, there's a whole range of things that, that can influence um, stuff. But yeah, so trust trust the people in communities and, and try and, again, sorry, back to funding, try and find a bit of funding to help facilitate stuff, I guess. I think I, I'd add to that. I mean, this goes from the previous question as well. I think one of the things for me is, is the communication, always keeping communication open between all of these different areas, the, the communities that Ollie said, the universities, the schools, the industry itself, and having that discourse to continually evolve and be open to the fact that, okay, maybe that doesn't work. So what can we do? And being adaptable, and always communicating and being open with people, not having, oh, well, okay, well, they've succeeded, but they're not going to share that idea, you know, keeping it open so that everybody can benefit from all of the things that are happening in education and the industry as a whole. I think collaboration, like you were saying earlier, Ollie, that's the way forward in all of this. And I think that historically there's been so much of, almost secrecy or you know we're doing this so we don't need to do anything with anyone else because and I think that has completely um been thrown out now which is fantastic that we're seeing more and more collaboration from competitors from uh, certainly from manufacturers in the live event uh, side um and yeah, it's and production companies, and it's amazing because actually, the more you work together, the louder your voice, and the more we, the louder we are, and um, the la then the more viable the music industry is as a career. Because, and I suppose because we're so hidden, and yeah, the performer is is not, but everybody else, but the performer is, and I think. You know, it's just a statistic from Glastonbury, for example, you know, there's 200,000 people on site, and 50,000 are working. And just to know that statistic alone just says so much about how many roles go into putting just one event together, um, which and with all the artists and all of their crews and all of their amazing creative um, other suppliers and and everyone that goes into making that that event happen for one and how everyone's just as important as the other in that um and that ecosystem is so important to put those hidden job roles into the uh, spotlight more and the only way we can do that is to collaborate as an industry together i think that the the education sector is doing well to um to help uh students with the evolving technologies but I also think you know the evolving technologies are doing well to help the students themselves and so I think partly what you know Oliver said about trusting them um, is is important because as they you know as a as a young person um, comes to uh, education you know they also have a way of wanting to be taught and a way of engaging the specific things you know, and I think it's important that, you know, we recognize where they are, particularly as our educators, as our um, tutors and teachers who face them, I think it's important that they recognize, you know, where they are as um, students and how they are engaging with this technology and how also to some extent this technology is out of our control. And, you know, there will be new, you know, there'll be overnight sensations made uh, you know, tomorrow and, and, and all of this stuff. I think partly what's important, if I must say, is is to educate students really on 
Um, one, how life often isn't done overnight. And although, you know, everything in our world has this Insta feel to it, um, it often isn't an Insta career that happens. It's something that takes forging and takes time and takes, you know, a lot of effort. And to touch on something Ruth said earlier as well, I think the other thing here is to also, with this technology uh, and as uh, education uh, supports, you know, students with it, it is important to have a sense of um, mental health in all of this, because, you know, when we leave, uh, when we leave education and we do go into this uh, sort of realm of where do I get my job, as you know, as everybody does when they sort of leave education, there is this sort of, um, sense of instability that musicians go through uh, when they don't necessarily know, you know, that they know that they're passionate about this career path, but there's nothing open to them right now. And of course, there is, you know, a job at the local supermarket open that will take them today because they have to pay that rent. And again, you know, a lot of the people I mentioned that no longer are in this uh, career path is it's those decisions they had to make, you know, it's not, it's not that I'm any better than them, it's that they had a practical decision to make in their life at a time which was pinnacle to their career uh, and, and they did so. Um, so again, I, I, I think education is doing well to, is doing well to help with technologies. You know, often students access things like studios uh, when they can't do outside of the, you know, being able to afford one yourself or being able to attend one for the day is really costly. So those types of things are really, really helping as well. There's always room for improvement, but I think that it, it is something that is um, is in a relatively good state right now, as long as we consider, um, again, the Insta life that isn't real and the mental um, health that should be um, considered when um, interacting with these technologies in, in this line of work. Thank you.